before it became a household name. Back then, it was just a no-go. The Sony execs were like, we are not a toy company, and we are not going to get into this business. Before it dominated the world of gaming, Sega had managed to capture 52% of the market in both Europe and the United States. It was only an underdog, thought up by a man with a vision. Ken is, uh, I guess you could call him a genius. Here in the US, people were saying, can Sony deliver games? Could they really enter the hardware side? I remember having dinner with a vice president of Sony Records, and he told me, the PlayStation's never gonna work. Sony's gonna lose on this. Witness the birth, betrayal, and rebirth of the video game console that changed the world. Sony revolutionized the industry. It's that simple. This is the history of the PlayStation. A company named Sony helps the people of Japan rebuild from the ashes. Sony is a classic post-World War II success story in Japan. They started making cassette recording machines. They created a small cassette player that played back and recorded stuff off the bat, and that was the beginning of Sony Electronics. Innovative products such as the Walkman helped Sony become one of the most successful electronics companies in the world. Well, whenever people talk about Sony, a lot of people think about the Walkman. The Walkman was definitely Sony's first consumer product that really exploded. It was the portability of music, and everyone walked around with headphones. They really revolutionized the idea of portable music listening. As Sony gains more and more ground in the consumer electronics world, the video game industry grows by leaps and bounds. And by the early 1990s, the war for gamers' dollars is red hot. Sega and um, Nintendo are really dueling in the West. Sega had managed to capture 52% of the market in both Europe and the United States. Sega was more innovative at the time. They were always willing to take more chances. Sega was coming out with 70, 80 games of its own per year. The strategy of Nintendo was, let's hold on for the next Miyamoto game. Nintendo pays close attention when Sega unveils its latest technological advancement. So Sega came out with the Sega CD. All of a sudden, games were going to be huge. They could be 600 megabytes of information. To meet the Sega CD threat, Nintendo turns to Sony. Nintendo wanted a partner, so they went to Sony, which, of course, was a huge, successful company. Sony may not have been a video game company, per se, but the Super NES used a Sony stereo chip for its sound. Sony was certainly, in its own way, a player in the video game industry in a small way. So it was a race. Nintendo knew that CD-ROM technology was the way to go. And the original concept was a peripheral CD drive for the Super Nintendo that would be sold by Nintendo. And a combined unit, which would be called PlayStation, which was the console and the CD drive together, which would be sold by Sony. Sony brought in an engineer named Ken Kutaragi. Well, when you talk about the PlayStation, you just have to talk about Ken Kutaragi, who is considered the father of PlayStation. He came in to Sony in 1975. Right off the bat, he was considered to be kind of a brash engineer. He was very feisty and had a lot of ideas. He uh, struck me immediately as a very forceful character. He had a clarity of thought and insight, which I think was, I still think to this day, is, is very rare. He clearly is a visionary. Very dynamic, very energetic, full of ideas, and very creative. He's known to be a fantastic engineer and a brilliant uh, person on the engineering and technical side, but that's just a happening. I met Ken Kuragi once. It was not like you were looking at, at an executive who was buttoned up. We were looking at a guy who was in the trench who was clearly an engineering mind and was resolving problems. 
he's an impressive mind and he's achieved impressive things. The idea of working on a video game console is nothing new to Kutaragi. He was thinking about making a 3D game console a long, long time ago while people were tinkering away on 8-bit gaming. He approached Norio Oga, who was then president of Sony, and said that we should get into the video game industry. But back then, it was just a no-go. Olga and the Sony execs were like, we are not a toy company, and we are not going to get into this business. So that was that. But now, things are different. Hand in hand, Ken Kutaragi and the people at Nintendo team up to bring Sega to its knees. But Sony is about to face a bitter betrayal that will change the course of gaming history. Real time for... As Sega prepares its new CD-ROM expansion for the Genesis, Nintendo and Sony work on a CD-ROM system of their own. But Nintendo begins to have second thoughts. The big reason why Nintendo kind of balked on the Sony technology idea was that they weren't going to have any rights to the CD technology. Sony was going to retain all the making of the CDs, they were going to manufacture it, distribute it, and that totally cut Nintendo out of the picture on definitely a large profit margin. And that made Nintendo very, very nervous. So in the forefront, Nintendo's telling Sony everything's great. But behind the scenes, Nintendo went to Philips and said, why don't you start working on something for us? Nintendo's insecurities lead to a dramatic climax in 1991. CES comes around, and Ken Kutaragi and Sony come out, and they announce the Nintendo PlayStation, because they don't know anything's going on. Nintendo made a sudden announcement and said, well, we're going to work with Philips on the CD technology. That didn't go very well with Sony execs, and Ken Kutaragi was definitely very bummed. He went into Norio Oga's office and said, we just got backstabbed, blindsided by Nintendo. We had an agreement, and they totally betrayed us. Kutaragi went back to his bosses and said, let's not leave it like this. We can make an actual game system. We won't stop with the CD-ROM. We'll build the whole system. And Olga, who was totally dead set against it before, now feeling the betrayal from Nintendo and the being the samurai corporate guy that he is, said, that's it. Pounded his fist on the desk and said two famous words, do it. And that was the beginning of the Sony PlayStation. Now, more driven than ever, Ken Kutaragi and Sony set out to make a video game console unlike any other. At first, Sony plans to release a system that plays both CD-ROMs and Super Nintendo cartridges. In 1992, 200 units of this PlayStation are manufactured, but are quickly scrapped. Sony decides to wait for the next wave of consoles to enter the fray, and intends to capitalize on CD-ROM technology. There was a big change taking place in terms of media. Game media like cartridges, CD-ROMs, this really changed the finances behind game development and game publishing. In October 1993, Sony announces that it's working on a new 32-bit game console. The name of this new system is the PlayStation X, or PSX. The CPU for this console will be designed by Ken Kutaragi himself. On November 16th, the company officially forms Sony Computer Entertainment. We formed Sony Computer Entertainment Inc. as a company, as a joint venture between Sony Corp and Sony Music Japan. This new department raises more than a few eyebrows. When PlayStation was being mentioned here in the US, people were saying, can Sony deliver games? Could they really enter the hardware side? To some people within Sony, PlayStation represented the future and was very exciting, but to other people, it was definitely a threat and something that they didn't fully understand. You had a lot of people that were pretty much skeptical about us getting into uh, the business. Even before we came out, we were pretty much placed in the, uh, the failure column because we were just newcomers. I remember having dinner with a vice president of Sony Records, and he told me, the PlayStation's never gonna work. Sony's gonna lose on this. The irony for all of us was that as much credibility as Sony had 
in as a brand. We had zero credibility as far as the world of games was concerned. Sony, I think, corporately was a little discouraged. How do we get into this new charted area? Sony knows that the road ahead won't be easy, but Ken Kutaragi has an ace up his sleeve that will dazzle the entire game industry. Sony Computer Entertainment goes full bore into the development of the PlayStation. It becomes clear that this will be a console unlike any other. The biggest feature of PlayStation was going to be the real-time 3D graphics technology. At the time, the PlayStation was a faster console than anything out in the market. It could push more polygons. It gave developers a larger toolbox to work with than any of the competing consoles. And of course, it used CD-ROMs. After watching the failure of systems like the 3DO very closely, Sony realizes that processing power alone isn't enough to come out on top in the world of video games. We looked at uh, the business models um, of all of the companies uh, that have been in the space or tried to get in the space, and we asked ourselves, could we do this better? The biggest problem that we had was that the market in 1993 was dominated by Sega and Nintendo. They pretty much had it sewn up between them, so any new entrant into the market had to do something pretty dramatic and pretty special. Sure, we had the system, sure, we had the hardware, but it doesn't mean anything unless you have games. Nintendo already had Miyamoto, and he was a genius. Sega, they already had their arcade games, but Sony, what do they have? They don't have a genius developer or arcade games they're making, so they had to find software somewhere. We knew that in order to be successful, we had to capture the hearts and minds of the developers and the publishers equally. So what they did was they went on a very aggressive campaign to all the developers to... If Sony had not brought hardware to the video game industry, I think the industry would be a lot smaller than it is right now. Enough to really differentiate this system and show that it was a 3D-based system and it really blew everybody away. But at first, a lot of developers were dead set against it, mainly because it was high technology, it was 3D. And a lot of game companies were still making 2D games, and they said, that's going to be so expensive to make 3D games, no way we can afford it, and it's going to be very hard. Fight one, ready, go! One game that changed it and helped Sony, ironically, was Virtua Fighter. Sega announced Virtua Fighter for the first time, and that completely opened up eyes of other publishers that showed that 3D graphics can be applied to other types of games. All of a sudden, it was a leap. I couldn't keep up with enough of the companies that were coming to us. They were asking us, can we do this? Is it possible to do this? Everybody wanted to work on the system. Sony does everything it can to round up third-party developers to support the PlayStation and is able to sign 250 in Japan alone. The first task for me was managing the third-party departments to recruit and help support third parties like Namco. My target was to get as many publishers and many popular title franchises to become available on PlayStation. Sony also spends $48 million to purchase Psygnosis, the European developer behind Lemmings, and changes its name to Sony Interactive Entertainment. In December of 1994, Sony releases the PlayStation, now without an X, in Japan. The success in Japan was almost instantaneous another three months to get to the million mark in Japan. And I remember the then chairman of Nintendo saying that if we ever got to a million units, he would resign because he clearly knew nothing about the games business. It took him a few more years to actually get around to it, but I thought it was a great statement. The next step is ensuring a successful launch in the US and Europe. To pull this off, Sony spares no expense. The Japanese giant spends a rumored $4 million for a booth at E3 in 1995. Sony also kicks off a huge marketing blitz to raise awareness for the PlayStation. The marketing strategy 
was very clearly defined from the beginning that we needed to appeal to an older, more sophisticated audience. We also had a very smart bunch of people in our marketing department who recognized that everybody really wants to be 19. If you're 12, you want to be 19. If you're 25, you really want to be 19 again. And so what they did was they targeted 19 as the communication tone of voice. Another thing that, that I think was really um, key to establishing that credibility for us was the idea that gamers wanted to work a bit harder at deciphering messages, you know, teasing a date like 9995, playing with Enos, which was essentially Sony spelled backwards. And Sony was saying games are a lifestyle, and we're going to promote and work it from a lifestyle perspective. We very deliberately stayed away from making SONY, the Sony brand, a big part of the communications message. The initial tagline of you are not ready was the first big step that we took in saying, this is not your parents' Sony brand. With this new mindset, Sony sets out to conquer the United States. nationwide marketing blitz unlike any other. Sony launches the PlayStation in the United States on September 9th, 1995. The first day, September 9th, I felt really like, oh, we did it. But it was not really a huge amount of numbers in the first year. It's like only 800,000 units. The uh, initial launch of the PlayStation was a real happy day for me. It just was overwhelming. For a relatively unknown company, at least in the video game business, to get that kind of enthusiasm from, from day one. The original PlayStation, I think, really touched a nerve. I think uh, part of that was down to the product itself. It's a great hardware device, and they lined up some great software. And I'd like to think we did some nice marketing as well. The controller of the PlayStation, like, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's just perfect. The PlayStation picks up more and more sales, thanks to powerful hardware and a collection of exclusive games and other hits. We had Ridge Racer as a driving game. OK, the final lap. Hang in there. So we had a driving game, and then I wanted a fighting game. So when I, I went out and hunted for that, I found Toshinden. If you look at the sexiness and the appeal of what Toshinden was about as a fighting game, it was fabulous. It was a major, major hit. Wow. Wow. In 1996, we came out and launched Crash Bandicoot. Crash Bandicoot was a terrific launch title. Defined PlayStation as a platform. And it was about a year or so after the launch of PlayStation, one detective at Squaresoft said he's going to make Final Fantasy on PlayStation. At that point, I felt that the older ties will change. The PlayStation proves to be a juggernaut that plows through all competition. The Saturn launched before PlayStation in 1995, which was the wrong time to launch. Also at a very expensive price point. I believe it launched at $399 versus $299. The PlayStation launched. and did not have very good games. But it was around Thanksgiving and going into the holiday of 1995 where we started getting reports that uh, the retailers were just not going to have enough PlayStation units to last them through the holiday selling season. It really turned into a uh, feeding frenzy. The success of the PlayStation goes beyond even Sony's expectations. Eventually, the success of the PS2 kind of like brought the PS1 era to a, to a close. But you can still walk into Toys R Us and buy PS1 games. The PlayStation has changed the world of gaming as we know it. If Sony had not brought hardware to the video game industry, I think the industry would be a lot smaller than it is right now. Before the original PlayStation came out, the media perception of the video game business was that it's basically a toy for kids. 
but we saw the PlayStation as not really a platform of entertainment for kids, but really an interactive entertainment platform for everybody. Sony revolutionized the industry with the PlayStation. It's that simple. They started off as an underdog, and in 10 years have managed to own over half the market, and that's, that's just incredible. There are now over 35 million PlayStation 1 machines in the US and Canada combined, which puts us at an unbelievable household penetration rate compared to other game systems. And I think for many consumers, PlayStation equaled gaming. Today, Sony remains number one. The PlayStation successor, the PlayStation 2, has shipped more than 90 million units worldwide and is still going strong. Sony is moving into the portable gaming market with the PSP, while the next generation PlayStation 3 is just around the corner. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the father of the PlayStation, Ken Kutaragi. And the man that started it all is still at the helm, ready for the next challenge. And now, I have the final and the biggest announcement. Ken Kutaragi is a man who has, like, years in advance plotted out in his head and has an amazing vision of where he wants video games to go. Ken is really the father of the PlayStation. He always believed PlayStation would be number one. You know what? I have to applaud him. He was right.